Welcome to the Susan Brender Show. It's all about you. Featuring shows on health and wellness, the performing arts, politics, and people who inspire you to be your very best. And now, here's Susan Brender. This has been brought to you by Megger, a company that has been serving the electrical test and measurement industry for over 100 years. I'm Susan Brender, and this is the Susan Brender Show. Today, my guest is very unusual. She's doing something that is so incredibly interesting that I'm sure everybody is going to find very informative and very educational. Now, Lisbeth is the founder of Horses Healing Hearts, and she's also the executive director. Now, Horses Healing Hearts helps children whose parents are suffering from substance use disorder. It also uses horses to teach children empathy, responsibility, and improve their self-esteem. We have so much to talk to her, to her about, and I want her to tell us a little bit more about the organization and what it does and how it does it. And it's, you know, one made her qualified to do it. There are so many things that I think Elizabeth can discuss today with us that you're going to find this show pretty fascinating. And it's not about me, it's about Elizabeth and all the <laughs> children that she helps. So welcome to the Susan Brender Show, Elizabeth Oshetsky. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very much. Yeah, so I started this group um, in 2009. I was one of those children. Um, I grew up in an alcoholic home, very dysfunctional, sometimes violent. Uh, my mother was an alcoholic, my father, and later she divorced and remarried, and my stepfather was an alcoholic. So this was all around me. And um, back then, and even still now, although it's getting better, but there's a lot of shame surrounding this disease. And when you grow up in this home, uh, we learn these three unspoken rules, don't talk, don't trust, and don't feel. Mm. And no one told us this. We just somehow learned it, and that's how you adapt and, and survive in that home environment. But it's a very lonely and sometimes scary place to be. So uh, my stepfather, when I was 12, he decided to get sober, and he sent me to his sister's in Pennsylvania, and she had horses, and she was also a concert pianist. And recently she had rescued a Mustang that um, had little gray scars all over his body. He had, you know, he was wild and he had kind of escaped from a lot of abuse. And she adopted him and ended up taking him to a very high level in dressage at Dressage at Devon. And I just looked at that horse and I, I saw their relationship. And when I was in Jonathan, um, that was his name, in Jonathan's presence, it was the first time in life that I really felt accepted and whole, and it was life-changing. So I was about 12 when that happened, um, and that was my first exposure to horses. And um, shortly after that, my mom was diagnosed with six months to live. She ended up living another 10 years. The doctors were wrong, but another aunt in Dayton, Ohio, ended up raising me because we thought, you know, she was going to die soon. So um, about 10 years ago, and, you know, since my aunt's raising me my life, I had somewhat of normalcy or healthy living, if you will, and a lot of people don't have that advantage of being exposed to that, that, um, that surrounding. So I look back and I say that mentors and horses really saved my life and kept me from following in the footsteps of my mother. No, I'm going to interrupt you only to say sure. that I've seen a number of movies, and I remember one in uh -huh. particular that really gave you an understanding of the possibilities that horses can provide to people with disabilities. Um, uh -huh. I don't remember the name, but I do remember that it was set in Mongolia, of all places, huh. and a yeah. pa two parents, husband and wife, took their uh -huh. son, who had autism, and they took uh -huh. him to find this horse, the uh -huh. results of this situation was that this kid came from a very low uh, on the spectrum, um, I want to say it might have been Asperger's or autism, mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. moment he got on that horse, everything changed. Yeah, and it's interesting you bring that up because um, we have been using horses for therapeutic reasons, both for, for individuals who are physically disabled and autism for about the past, I don't know, 15, I think it's gone back as, 30, as far as 30 years with unbelievable success. And part of the reason that that is, and I can get a little bit into this, although 
we do something very different in, in a sense that our kids have an emotional trauma, almost like a PTSD response as a result of their upbringing. But right. we're right now we're the only ones who, who do that in the nation. But what's interesting about horses is they're very right-brained. And we as humans, we can be right or left-brained, but they're a prey animal. So their natural instinct and constant awareness is about survival. So what they require from us as humans, and this is a lot of the reason why it helps with children of, of alcoholics and addicts, is they require three things. Number one, they want us to be present. And by present, I mean, you know, emotionally, if we're thinking about tomorrow or yesterday, we're not in the moment. I liken it to humans as you're talking to someone and they're looking at their phone and texting. How annoying is that? You know, you're not getting any eye contact. You just know they're not with you. And that's how a horse feels when we're standing next to them and our mind isn't on the present. They also require us to be congruent. And by congruent, I mean, you know, as, as, humans, we can hold two truths. We can, internally, we can be miserable, but on the outside, we can present a face that I'm fine, everything's great, you know, wonderful, right, right. but a horse will instantly sense that. And that incongruence makes them very nervous because now they don't know our intention with them. Being prey, it's like, are you going to hurt me? Are you going to eat me? Are you going to attack me? What's going to happen? So if someone's not congruent and their ability to, to sense that and know that has developed over millions of years of them surviving. And so if you think about, you know, we all as people have kind of an energy bubble, if you will, that is about, I don't know, seven to eight feet. Horses is actually 80 feet. So they can sense if a lion or a tiger 80 feet out is just faking sleeping and ready to pounce or really sleeping. And again, that had to develop because they couldn't make any noise. They had to use their energy. If they made a noise, they were dead. So we use that skill both with adults in recovery, and I'll get into that in a little bit, and with children, to force them almost, if you will, to be congruent and feel their feelings. And as a result, you know, like I said earlier, they're stuffing their feelings because it's painful. They don't want to feel it. And when they get to the farm, I say, similar to how a dog can smell fear, a horse can sense when you're not matching from the inside to the outside. Yeah. I always hear uh, people, Elizabeth, say that a dog is man's best friend. But it sounds like when you're discussing horses, they're really man's best friend. Is that true? <laughs> well, they're an, excellent, they're an excellent feelings detector. And a dog is prey. And, yes, they can be, you know, they're pack animals and they can be very friendly and intelligent. But horses are super intuitive. And they just know when, when we're going through something and they kind of absorb what we're going through. And um, it, it's just, they're amazing. For, for those in the audience who've been around them and sensed it and, and known it, you, when you feel it, you know. And sometimes when you just stand in the presence of a horse, you get very emotional. Some people call it spiritual or emotional and they can't really put their finger on it. But um, I know instantly what it is, is that that horse is seeking connection. And if someone is vulnerable and brave enough to be honest and, and authentic with their feelings, a horse very much appreciates that. And um, right. I don't hold you. Do, do we have a time for a two-minute story about showing how Absolutely. this happens? Absolutely. Go kids? on. Okay. Let's hear it. So like I said, when they come, I give the analogy of the dog and the horse and the feelings. And I had a girl raise her hand one time. She was about 13. And she said, what if I've forgotten how to feel? And she had a real look of panic on her face. And mm. I was kind of stunned and my mouth opened and I went, well, uh, just keep coming back. I mean, I, I felt a little ignorant in the moment, but I didn't know what else to say. But about her third trip back, she was brushing the horse's mane, and I walked up behind her, and I saw her shoulder shaking. And I thought, you know, she's crying. So I get up next to her, and I just sit there for a moment, and I look at her, and I said, what's going on? And she said, the floodgates just opened. All my feelings are coming, and I have no idea what's what. I can't name them. I don't know if they're good, if they're bad. And I said, just let it happen. You know, it's, it's the floodgates. You've, you've kept them down for so long. So about mid cry, she stops and she looks at my eyes and the horse's eyes. And she said, are my tears upsetting the horse? And right there shows us that codependent behavior that happens with children and, and adults and anyone who lives in, in a home with addiction. And I looked at her and I said, no, no, your tears are not upsetting him. If you were to hide your tears, that would upset him because you wouldn't be being authentic. But he's very, very okay with your tears that you're crying. And she looked at me and she kind of cried a little more. And at the end of the day, she came up to me and she said, I don't want you to think I'm all better. And I said, okay. And she goes, but I have to tell you, 
in my body, I feel lighter. And that amazed me because I know it's, you know, I'm not a therapist, but I've been around a lot of therapists. And I know one thing they always do is when someone has a very deep emotional feeling, they say, where can you, where can you say you feel that in your body? Is it in your gut? Is it in your heart? Is it in your throat? You know, where is it? And I know that is like a sign of healing. So three weeks ago, she didn't even know, remember or know how to feel. And now she's recognizing and feeling in her body that she feels lighter. And it wasn't no. me. It was the horse. That was incredible. Um, don't, don't give yourself some credit, uh, Liz, yeah. because, you know, you say that you're not a therapist, but the reality is that you've been around this business for so long that you mm-hmm. see things that other people would never see. And one of the right. things that I think is incredible is the fact that you were able to talk to her and make her understand what she was feeling. This is, this is very mm-hmm. special. Now, Thank I want to ask you something. You know, the mm-hmm. movie The Horse Whisperer, uh, mm-hmm. also made this whole situation with horses, you know, out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, gave mm-hmm. people an idea that horses can really be a companion, if you will. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. I want to know something. Did mm-hmm. they exaggerate the situation? or uh, is, uh, And I'm hoping that you you did see it. Did they exaggerate it? Or you know what? I, ha- real? I haven't seen it. I'm embarrassed to say. And I know it's a classic movie that I need to see, but... You know, every movie that I see about horses that really I think is true shows the vulnerability of man and the, um, the, the desire of the horse for the man to always be a safe or woman to be a safe, consistent leader. And it's ironic because when we see horses do things and act up, if you will, and we think they're being naughty or, and you can almost liken this to children and their parents, they're actually testing boundaries. And they're saying, are you still there? Are you still a safe leader? Are you going to overreact and scold and hurt me? Or are you going to safely say, no, this is a limit, and it's not going to go past this? And they like that. They want a leader, but they want a fair and consistent leader, as do kids. So there's a lot of similarities there. And they'll, they're smart animals because they will constantly test you, and they're 1,200 pounds. So yeah. they know, and, and they tend to be a little lazy like us too. So they're going to test those waters, and if you don't know how to react around them or how to guide them or be a good leader, they won't hurt you, but they won't do any more work than is necessary. <laughs> just go. You. You know, you know, I'll you tell can't you a story, uh, Elizabeth. <laughs> uh, many years ago, I went to um, Costa Rica, and in Costa Rica, uh, we decided, uh, my husband and I, to rent horses and go uh-huh. on a ride. I have never experienced something like this in my entire life. Now, not that I ride a lot. I mm-hmm. maybe ride uh, once a year. That that was mm-hmm. many years ago, in fact. Mm-hmm. But I got on that horse, and there was something about that horse that I felt that we were bonding. And I mm-hmm. felt that, that that horse just understood how to move so that I wouldn't hurt myself because I wasn't mm-hmm. experienced. And mm-hmm. we were like one. And I told my mm-hmm. husband all the time, I said, I've never experienced something like that where you feel that you're one with the horse. That's mm-hmm. how that horse made me feel. Somebody Incredible. told me it's yeah. Special, yeah. it has a special gait. It's a special movement. Um mm-hmm sound familiar to you is there is there a yeah no we see it i mean how i came up with the idea to do this group is i was sidewalking at a group that helped autistic kids and it was amazing to see the different um levels of their autism and how affected they were and then how the horse would change its gait or motion based on who was on top of the horse and it went you know, opposite of what you would thought in terms of people say, oh, horses, they're more spunky in the beginning, and then they get tired. No, it was the opposite. This horse would, if a person who kind of needed a slower gait was on them, they would literally slow down in the beginning, and then three rides later, when you'd say, well, I've got to be tired now, they would get a higher energy person on them, and they'd pick up their gait. So, again, they can totally sense. I read an excellent book, too, about it's called The Zen Horse, can't remember the author's name, but he's the medical consult for Gray's Anatomy, and he's a brain surgeon. So you talk about left and right brain. You know, as a brain surgeon, it's all left brain, and in horses, they require us to get into the right side of our brain, which is more artistic and feeling and intuitive. And going between those two spans and the ability to do that is, I think that requires a high emotional intelligence, and that's, in this world, what they say can make you really, you know, excel and and survive in this world very well. 
So it's, mm-hmm. it's, it, you can visually see it when you see different children get on different horses and how the horse changes their gait. It's, wow. there, there's nothing in your imagination that indeed happens. You know, it's a very curious thing to me. You know, we have schools uh, where we mainstream kids with autism, and and mm-hmm. it's very difficult for the teacher. It's very difficult for the kid. And um, mm-hmm. I, I wonder, you know, if you know so, so much about the way horses react or the way kids react to horses, why don't you think schools would adapt that for kids with disabilities such as autism? You know, I don't. I can't speak for schools. I can guess that there's probably some element of liability that they're pretty concerned about because they're all with horses. There always is a chance they're a horse. You know, they're a prey animal. They can react quickly. But I can tell you, on an individual, private basis, I don't know the stats because autism, you know, isn't. It's kind of a side thing. It's not really what we do. But for individuals use horses. It's it's amazing. There's all kinds of evidence-based studies out there that show the um, success rate using horses with kids with autism. So, and with children, that's kind of what we're hoping to get into in this next year or two is in the nonprofit world, whenever you get grant money, they want impact studies. They want to see, you know, how did you move the needle? So I'm up against, or we are up against a few challenges, and that is number one, our mission statement of helping children with addiction is, it's difficult because not everybody wants to talk about it. You know, still there is that societal uh, stigma of shame, and it's getting better. You know, the Surgeon General just announced that, well, he announced it about six months ago, that addiction is a brain disease. It's a true brain disorder with so many different elements of, you know, cognitive, emotional, psychological. And um, I don't know if you heard this, but the Surgeon General also announced, I think, in the last 90 days, that with the heroin epidemic that, that is upon us right now, for those under the age of 50, overdose is the leading cause of death right now, which is Say unbelievable. Say that again. Give me that stat. For those individuals under 50, for people under the age of 50, overdose is the leading cause of death right now. Overdose. Wow. Now, yep. you testified before Congress. Uh, that was in yeah. 2018, wasn't it? Uh, 2016, uh, rather. 16, now, yeah, May. What did you what did you want them to to know and what did you want them to tell you basically so it's interesting that was under the CARA Act Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act and we were invited by a group um, called National Association for Children of Alcoholics that's been around for 30 years and they wanted testimony both from Dylan who we brought who's been a participant and he was the only one under the age of 18 out of I think 42 people invited that gave the child's perspective most of this were adults who've lost their kids to heroin and he was the only one that said, hey, you know, we're here, we need guidance, we need structure, we need to be taught how to, how to live a healthy lifestyle. And, you know, mainly we wanted to be heard in terms of that this group is out there, it's a vulnerable population, and they're, you know, I, I often hear it said they're the first to be affected by addiction and they're the last to be helped. So number one, we wanted to put that point out. Number two, we wanted verbiage in the CARA Act that, supported not only the addict, but the family of the addict, because it truly is a family disease. And in many cases, you can take the addict and they can go through recovery and be fine. But the problem is when they come home, that whole family has been affected by that dynamic. And I've often been, you know, I've heard it been compared to like, if you have the baby mobiles that are over the crib and that one alcoholic is always kind of absent from the family so that other people carry that weight. Well, then when you bring this person back and they're carrying more weight, everything's out of balance. You know, the people yeah. who are used to carrying the weight don't need to carry it anymore. And sometimes they almost resent that. The like, guy's been here carrying the weight for eight years and now you're going to come back sober and take that back from me. And what if you relapse in a week and then I have to change again? You know, there's a lot of family dynamics that go along with that. So, you know, verbiage in the CAR Act that supported getting help, emotional and, and counseling and, um, you know, education for the family to be able to deal with this disease. And then finally, trying to get our um, student assistant support programs back in the schools. Years ago, when I was being raised by my aunt, there was something that was basically the beginnings of Alateen, but it wasn't called that. And um, one of my teachers knew I was struggling, and she asked me if I would come out of social, uh, excuse me, out of study hall. No one would know why, but I would go to a group of my peers and I walked in, and there were cheerleaders and jocks and hoods and punks 
and freaks and everything you can imagine, everything oh, it represented. I remember looking and going, but no one knew. It, it, no one wanted to admit it out in public, but in that room, we could be who we are. We could share our feelings and not have shame. And that's kind of the, the seeds that I planted in my head, how I felt. And that's when I started HHH, I thought, I want everyone to be able to look at each other and know. And, you know, a lot of my friends fought me from having the words addiction in my mission. They're like, you're going to, there's so many problems you're going to face and the stigma. And I, and I have faced some of those, but I fight it and I still hold those, those words there because for me, truth was healing. And when we start adopting that truth and saying, I am a child of an alcoholic, it's not my fault. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're not a bad person. They're a sick person. But when we start talking about facts and realities and truths and not having that shame, we start to heal. So that's an integral part of it. You know, I could think about a number of things, Elizabeth, that would uh, give people an opportunity to have the opportunity you've had, which is Mm -hmm. our military. That would be Mm -hmm. one place. Um, Mm -hmm. Our schools, as I discussed Mm -hmm. with you before and as you said, Mm -hmm. and um, various different organizations which would give people, not only people with addictions, an opportunity Mm -hmm. to, you know, kind of talk about it, get support and that sort of thing, but Mm -hmm. also to have something to do in their lives. Elizabeth, you know, it seems to me that you're talking all about the people who have been helped, uh, but it's but it's also a situation where if schools got involved, if people from older people, for example, even octogenarians, and if they had a chance to help you out, would that be available to them? Absolutely. You know, our main goal of who we need as volunteers are healthy adults. And the age is really not important. I mean, yes, they need to be physically able to move around and and do things with the kids. But our kids look to any and all ages for healthy behavior. And, you know, many times our kids say, I just want to be normal. And I said, you know what, forget normal. Normal is a knob on a washing machine. I don't think there is no any normal anymore. But there's healthy and unhealthy. And when we talk about behaviors very openly, we say, and a lot of times I'll throw it to the group, is that healthy or unhealthy? And they, they talk about it. They figure it out. And our goal is to bring self-efficacy to them. We want them, regardless of whether they're coming to us or their parent relapses or whatever, we want them to have a toolkit they always have with them that they can, you know, have that self-confidence and that strength and that judgment and decision-making about how to get through life and choose a completely different path of someone who they've seen fall prey to addiction. But yeah, volunteers, as long as they are, you know, healthy individuals who are open to learning, and and we do, we put them through training and teach them um, uh, basically reflective listening is what it's called, then then yes, absolutely, we can use those people to help these kids. And who basically supports um, your organization, um, Horses Healing Hearts? Who who gives you um, the kind of opportunity to do more programs for for kids and, of course, adults? Well, that's all through finances, of course. Um, We are funded through um, some community or county um, organizations like the Palm Beach Sheriff's uh, organizations funded us for the last six of our eight years. And we do a large fundraiser, which is coming up here in February, uh, called White White West. That uh, you know provides a lot of our revenue for the year. Um, several private foundations, and we don't have any state or federal grants at this time, but we've looked into those. But it's a culmination. And then also we have a social enterprise sustainability model where we actually provide equine therapy for adults going through treatment, but we can also do it for other populations. Um, and we're just now starting one for Fortune 500 companies where they come out, they bring their executive team out, and it's more of like a personnel training development course, and Mm -hmm. it really opens their uh, vision in terms of if they have a product launch or something coming up, teaching their executives to think outside of the box and using horses as a tool to do that. And a lot of corporations, Walmart, Sam's, a lot of them have done it. Oh, that is incredible. That's really um, helpful. Uh, now, I'm just curious, since we you're doing this in Florida, and there mm-hmm. probably are opportunities all over the world, basically, um, mm-hmm. have you ever thought of being a mentor or teaching people in other states, other countries, how to do uh, use horses for this healing? Has that been a reality for you or not? 
Um, we've actually thought my long-term goal is to have HHH be in every state in the nation. I don't know how, you know, how long that's going to take to come to fruition, but if you think about it, horses in the handicap is in a lot of states. And when you look at our population and our numbers, we're, and we have a lot higher numbers. So children of alcoholics, they say are one in four. In other words, every child under the, um, all children under the age of 18 out of all of them, at least one, one out of every four is living with one parent who's addicted to something. So those numbers are staggering. And, you know, I've created a model kind of by accident whereby we don't even own the barn or the horses. We go to an existing barn and we rent the horses and the, the trainers during the time that we need them. So we don't have mm. the financial burden of, you know, the vet, the hay, the shavings, you know, all because in Florida especially, it's about $1,000 per horse per month to keep horses. So it's really cost prohibitive here. But I likened our model after one in um, – in LA called Horses in the Hood. And I, by accident, just came up with something that works. So we are looking to replicate that and um, take this, you know, nationwide so we can help more kids. That's a wonderful, wonderful, um, you know, possibility. And I think that if people listen to the show and they hear all the things that you're talking about, uh, that you're going to get a tremendous amount of support. And it seems like it would be one of the most incredible things to have people um, who, you know, really understand that alcoholism and drug addiction and autism and all of these things are part of the way everybody uh, overacts to situations mm-hmm. of abuse and various other things. So mm-hmm. if I always say to, to my guest, Elizabeth, I said, if you have the last word, what would you like to tell the audience? You know, I, I think what is most important is to let the audience so if you you can also help children of alcoholics unrelated to horses, if you know of anybody who's going through that situation, these children just want to be heard and they need a positive adult in their life. And you can be that person. So if you kind of sense and think that something like that is happening, it probably is. And the way that you help is just listen. Listen and be a positive mentor for them. Um, don't try and tell them their life is going to get better. Don't try and tell them how to solve a problem or fix a problem. They just want to be heard because they're not being heard at home. So you just people don't understand how much impact they can have on these kids, teachers, coaches, you know, people in churches or just a neighbor. Um, you can change someone's life just by listening and, and being strong and being there for them. Really. Yes. Now, if people want to get in touch with you, Elizabeth, and they are interested in bringing kids to your program, how do they do that? Mm-hmm. Sure. They can go on our website. Um, it's www.hhhusa.org, and there is a um, tab there called Forms. So on the forms, they can vol- do a an volunteer application or a participant application. Um, but just be sure, because there are some name confusions out there. We are Horses Healing Hearts in Palm Beach County. Um, there is one other organization, uh, West out west that's not us so when you pull us up just be sure it's palm beach county florida if you put any of those after horses healing hearts it'll come up with us Uh, so well my guest today has been elizabeth oshetsky and she is the founder and the executive director of horses healing hearts it's a phenomenal organization if you listen to the show you'll learn all the things that you can do to make people or young kids' lives more more exciting, more interesting, and, and healthy, which is the number one thing that we'd love to see kids do. And last but not least, this is what I want to know, Elizabeth. You know, every today, everything is done by computer. Uh, mm-hmm. You see people messaging. You see people just, you know, sending emails on and on and on. And if you had your choice, rather uh, a choice that said, okay, Forget the computer, forget all of that, and listen to animals, talk to animals, be part of that. Do you think that this would make an impact on our our families and our kids and all the people who are in trouble? There's no doubt. I mean, being around animals and horses and other animals, it, it, make, it forces you to be present. And I, I really think that that um, personal connection with another living being is amazing and we don't get enough of it you know we're on technology too much and it keeps us in our heads 
and not in our hearts and our bodies and, and keeping us aware and present. And I don't, you know, I don't know when we're going to feel the backlash of it. I think sometimes we already do, but I think being with animals and, and particularly horses is such a gift, but it, there's so much it can help you with. It's, it's kind of our uh, silent therapist, if you will. There you go. So thank you again, Elizabeth Oshetsky, for being on the Susan Brender Show, and I wish you all the luck in the world in getting all kinds of funding to make your program move forward and be part of part of the world, actually. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for this opportunity. This show is brought to you by the Spectrum Firm Incorporated, a helping hand on the FCC highway. The Spectrum Firm specializes in FCC licensing, related engineering and project management support in the private wireless industry. We offer FCC licensing, engineering support, and related services, including annual programs for license maintenance and renewal services, spectrum analysis, strategy, and frequency management. For more information, call 858 484 858 at www.thespectrumfirm.com. Thank you for listening to The Susan Brender Show. To be a guest, email sebrender at yahoo.com.